Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, flying solo. So the Warriors are now on a nine-day all-star break, which is something that they desperately need. I <laughs> desperately need. You fans desperately need. I had said, if you've listened to this podcast at any time over the last 10 games or so, I said that It'd be great if they went seven and three into the break, get a sense of who they are, get some momentum, et cetera, so that when they come back, they are refreshed, their bodies, their minds, and they can focus, you know, flip that proverbial switch that everybody says they might have. They might have it, but it's somewhere (laughs) in the basement and they seem to have misplaced it. But the Warriors did not go seven and three. They went five and five, which makes perfect sense because they are now 29 and 29, right at 500, right at mediocre, right at this point where it's like, hey, you know, a couple months ago, I said at a certain point, you are who you are and they are who they are. They lost to the Clippers. 134-124 at Crypto.com in LA. And, you know, they didn't have Steph, of course. No Gary Payton II. No Andrew Wiggins. He was a late scratch earlier in the day. And the Warriors, they fought valiantly. And they actually did a bunch of things better than they had previously. They had the same number of fouls as the Clippers, 22, which, you know, is a lot, but at least it was even. And they only had 11 turnovers to the Clippers' eight. And they got to the line a bunch, 27 times, more than the Clippers, actually. Clippers only went 22. So they were 19 for 27, whereas the Clippers were 19 of 22. And the Clippers actually also shot more threes. They were 17 of 36, whereas the Warriors were 15 of 34. So those are things that I always point out. But a lot has been said about when Kerr in the third quarter pulled Clay, Draymond, and Poole out of the game, and that's when the Clippers made their run. Bit of a coaching misjudgment, you could say, because that was clearly uh, an important part of the game. But hey, you know, the Warriors, they can score, but they can't stop anyone. And obviously, that's why they went out partly to get Gary Payton the second before they knew he was hurt. And I'll be honest, Don Nelson would be really, really proud of this team because they are super small and they really just have to outscore people. Bottom line, that's it. That's that's where they stand right now until Gary Payton II comes back. And me personally, as much as I would love to see him out there, I'm not banking on it anytime soon. So they need to regroup. And I think obviously – and I've said this for a while, they just need to get into the tournament. Ideally, the regular playoffs, not the play-in, but you know, who knows? We don't even know when Steph is coming back, so the play-in might be an option and sudden death uh, unless you get to the seven and eight spot. But let's look at the play-in because before I was like, obviously, the Warriors are going to get into the play-in. But the five teams that are right now out of the play-in are from the bottom up, the Rockets, the Spurs, the Lakers, the Thunder, the Blazers. You rewind maybe three weeks ago and I'm like, oh yeah, no problem. But right now, the way the Warriors are looking, the vibe around the team, their mojo, their energy, whatever you want to call it. And then the fact that you know dudes are out, Steph, and your defensive savior and your chemistry savior, Gary Payton II. Then, you know, the Blazers who beat the Warriors, who have added some guys. So they clearly, especially with Dame on the roster, (laughs) they're never just going to tank, at least when they're this close to just making the play-in. The Lakers, obviously they retooled. It really depends on LeBron James' foot ankle, whatever you want to call it, and whether AD can make it through the rest of the season. But they look like they'll be better than the 13th seed as of now. 
you never know. And then the OKC Thunder, hey, they would love a shot at Wembenyama, I'm sure, and to add more dudes to their young stable of uh, fun, talented players, right? But they get Chet Holmgren back next season, and they'll be even better. Uh, man, there are a lot of young teams <laughs> that are going to be fun to watch. Like just as an aside, the Thunder, the Magic, uh, the Pistons before Wiseman <laughs> went over there, and even more so now the Pacers. So, can the Warriors or will they get passed up by the Blazers, Thunder, or Lakers? Right now they're ninth. There's also the Jazz in tenth place, and it's all on the table. You know, it's all on the table right now. There's people who believe, and let's be honest, like no one can predict exactly because with this team, they look a little unpredictable, right? You think that they can just lock in and make it happen. But hey, I said a couple episodes ago that this team seems to be lacking the focus and the will to pull games out, the will to win. And in his post game presser, Draymond used that same word. They lack the will on defense. And we know defense is about effort, but at this at this stage of the game, where is it? What are you going to do? Do they think that they can just waltz into the postseason and, and just flip that switch, turn it on? Maybe. I mean, that's what a lot of people are counting on. But I said this maybe in the past month. The Warriors' habits, right, are there. And all it takes in a seven-game series is to have a game or two that you should win, especially if you're uh, the road team, that you have some of those bad habits rear their ugly heads. The execution, especially on the defensive end, the laps for a quarter and a half will cost you a game, a game or two, and then the series, and you're done. And then you're left with uh, holding your hands being like, well... Was that was that it? Is that worth it? So, you know, obviously you look at these standings and you're like, there's no way they fall out of the plan, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm not coming at this as like super optimistic or uh, super pessimistic. I'm just, you know, we got to look at this practically, you know, we're looking at a team that has shown some signs, but will come back and fall flat on their faces. They played well enough against the Wizards, but it's the Wizards and they were at home. So that's why you don't make a big deal about you know some of these games, some of these wins where it's like, okay, great. Now prove you can do it elsewhere. Against the Clippers, at least, at least they got up for the game and they showed effort. If Steph, Wiggins, and Peyton are healthy in this one, then that's a totally different game, right? But... They weren't, and it's not a question of, oh, if we were all healthy, all good to go. We're dealing with the reality that we don't know when these guys are coming back. I mean, Wiggins, he'll be back. You know, he's, he wasn't injured. It was a personal uh, reason that he that he missed that game. So when you really, really think about it, it's like, where will this team land? If they can just get healthy, right? That's the thing. If they can get healthy and they get in the tournament, then – All bets are off. That's one way you could look at it, right? Like there's two paths. It's that one where, you know, they they kind of steal some wins and they can get into the playoffs, into the play-in. And then with Steph healthy, they just go off, right? You shorten that rotation. And whether it's seven guys, eight guys, nine guys, you go for it. And you see where, where all that takes you. It might not take you very far because of the said habits and the the said defensive liabilities I've talked about, but maybe these guys are saving it a little bit, right? <laughs> Last season, they had an 18 and two start this season, not so much. So there is uh, less wiggle room, but we are still officially in the dog days of the season. The dog days actually end after the all-star break. So hey, maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's part of the veterans rhythms, but you know, that is perhaps delusional. And uh, it's, it's tough to say if they make this crazy, exciting run and really, really define 
<laughs> this dynasty, then maybe, maybe that is the story that gets written. But they just don't seem to have the energy, at least the vets and the young guys and the even middle aged guys in their mid 20s, whether that's Poole or Wiggins, they haven't shown the consistency either. Can all of those things come together in an inspired run? Yeah, sure, maybe. But at least last season, they were overall playing better top to bottom in terms of their playoff rotation. And right now, it's like, okay, maybe you'll get a good clay game. Maybe you'll get a bad pool game. You know what I'm saying? So uh, they haven't put it together. And for me to say it'll definitely happen is like, you know, silly, <laughs> right? Uh, you have hope. You have, we believe, maybe this turns into the, like uh, the we believe two team. Maybe they eke in and go through the play-in and get to the eighth spot and all of a sudden shock the world again and then just keep going and going, right? You know, you never count out this team and you can't count them out until they get beat. And maybe that's what this is all about, right? So that's one direction. The other direction is, you know, the mediocrity continues and worse comes to worse. They lose in the play-in. They lose flame out early. They uh, don't make the play-in and you just toss your hands up. Again, a lot of hand tossing. Uh, up in this season, but you look at that and it's like, well, great. You know, you have the season that didn't go anywhere. That was really weird. That had weird energy the whole time, whether you believe it or not. And now you haven't developed the young guys as you might have wanted to, uh, you shipped out a young guy. And so you punted on that. You gambled and didn't play the young dudes. I mean, you probably wanted to with the thought that the Warriors wouldn't be so mediocre all season and they wouldn't have to be fighting just to keep their head above water. So you didn't develop them. And if they fall flat at the end of the season, it's like, okay, well, there you go. You know, the dream of Gary Payton II saving the world doesn't happen because he's not even healthy by the time the Warriors stop playing. And then you go into the off season, it's like, what? Do you keep Draymond? Do you move on from, from the core? Does Bob Myers move on, right? He's like, uh, I'm done with this. I've done all I can. And why kind of try to rebuild something that has kind of run its course? Does Kerr move on? You know, I have no idea. Then they have two options, right? If Steph is still Steph and for all intents and purposes, that's what he's tracking to be. If Draymond resigns, and I assume he will, I don't know the specifics of the salary slots, but if you didn't know, and I've talked about this, moving Wiseman makes it more likely if the Warriors can sign Draymond. And that's what Obviously, Steph wants, and he should want that. But the thing to me is like, if you fall short, like really short, and you have Steph, Draymond, and Clay, do you, you know, kind of start developing young guys more, or do they pull a LeBron and say, you know, f them kids, and realize like this is their last gasp, maybe for like a year or two? And they sell the future and just try to get some pieces and see if it'll work. I don't know. You go back to three years ago, two years ago, a year ago, over the summer. That's absolutely not what I had expected, but you can see it because, you know, moving Wiseman was, as far as I can remember, the most LeBron esque roster move, like kind of using his leverage. It's the most LeBron-esque move he's ever made, like flexing a little bit, like saying, hey, I mean, I don't know if he went in there, I don't all those reports or whatever, but clearly hearing him talk in his presser and, you know, reading reputable journalists, the vets were like, you know, move him. And hey, that's what, well within their rights, but like, is that going to be the trend over the summer, et cetera, et cetera? You never know. 
you know, they may be like, okay, uh, Kaminga, PBJ, Moody, move them. You know, let's get, I don't know who's available. I mean, whatever, get, see if you can get OG Ananobi, you know, again, or see if you just find some random dudes who are in their mid twenties to like early thirties that Draymond and Steph feel that they can make a legit run with. And all of a sudden you're kind of looking like, you know, the Lakers uh, before the most recent trade, right? Just trying to piece things together. And it's tough because this warrior system is not easy to play in, especially if you don't have the reps in it. Uh, and sometimes you find out guys just aren't it. You know, to Michael Green has looked up until the last two weeks like he wasn't it for this roster, for this system on either end of the court. He's been playing better and they need him to, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. So it's really a big question mark to me, like which which way they can go. And that's part of the, as I said, previous episode, like excitement for me, like fascinating. Like I don't want to see this dynasty end, but the sheer evolution, the sheer change uh, and the sheer drama of it. And I'm not talking like melodrama or the basic stuff. I'm talking about just like, oh, wow, watching this dynasty figure out how to hold on to its last legs, its last gasps, whether that's, you know, this year, next year, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, right? If Steph ain't going anywhere. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. The Warriors, they can still look at the look at the buyout market. Again, not sure who Kerr and Myers will look at and be like, oh yeah, I'd actually play him. You know what I mean? That's that's <laughs> analysis that'll come up probably a little bit later. So the Warriors are, <laughs> and this is a joke, they are one and two in the post Wiseman era. So let's <laughs> keep tabs on that. I'm gonna keep tabs on that the rest of the season. Why not? And James Wiseman plays plays against the Celtics uh, in Boston, plays for the Pistons for the first time in this one. So we'll see how, how it goes. You know, I'm, I'm rooting for the kid. You know, I know there's a lot of antipathy, a lot of piss and vinegar for that dude amongst uh, Warriors folks. So it's, it's going to be interesting no matter what. Like, again, will the Warriors uh, rise up and find the switch so they can flip it for the postseason and have – an amazingly inspired, really entertaining run, or will they fall flat and just either not even make it or burn out before they actually want to? So that's that. And then the other direction is, you know, do they move forward? Because I can also see with, you know, Gary Payton, everybody's saying like, hey, Gary Payton's back. So uh, that's insurance for Dante DiVincenzo leaving because Dante DiVincenzo is going to get way more money somewhere else. And that's great. So that points towards, you know, you have... Steph, Clay, you re-sign Draymond, and you have Gary Payton in the second, and then you make moves. If it's a catastrophe, then everybody's on the table. Poole's contract becomes $23 million, and that's a slot that you can get somebody good with, especially if you combine them with like a, a Kaminga, a Moody, you know, a PBJ. And then you have Wiggins, who you could move to. So I think... Anything is on the table at that point. And, you know, I'm guessing that they would keep Wiggins. I'm guessing they would keep Poole because Poole is uniquely uh, built for this Warriors team because he can play uh, either spot, Steph's spot or Clay's spot. And we've seen as they get older, you're going to need that guy. So I can see them rolling with those dudes. And then Looney. You know, he's more valuable to the Warriors than he is to any other team, especially at his salary slot. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. 